And we're going to continue on Ephesians chapter 4, page 828. And, and this week is going to begin a shift. So in all of Paul's writings, Paul starts with a theme in all of his books, and he digs in topically and really theologically into an issue. And then what you'll see is you'll see a shift happen where he goes from theology to practical application. About halfway through chapter 4, this happens. So this morning, we're only going to cover the first half of chapter 4. I'd like to ask you this week to read the second half of chapter 4 sometime on your own. It'll take you all of about two or three minutes, but it'll begin the transition into what we're going to talk about next week. This week, we continue discussing the church, God's call to the church, and specifically, some gifts he's given to church and how it's supposed to function. Ephesians chapter 4 beginning with verse 1. And this week's a little bit more information heavy, uh, so be ready with your pen, your paper, and be ready to take some notes. So Ephesians 4, beginning of verse 1. It says, As a prisoner, prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Now, stop right here. Ch verse 2 is going to give us a job description. Here is what it should look like if we live by the calling we've received as Christ followers. If we're saying we're followers of Jesus, this is what it looks like. Verse 2, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all, and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why he says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to the people. Quick side note, you remember last week we talked about Paul's rants? He'll go on a God-ordained rabbit trail or kind of get sidetracked. That's what we're about to read. So we read about the gifts. Now we go to verse 9 and 10. Paul hits a sidetrack. He says, what does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Verse 11, now we go back to the gifts. So Christ himself gave apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does, it work, does its work. Now, Paul tells us here about five gifts the church has been given. But before we talk about the what of what the gifts are, let's talk about the why. Why has God given us these gifts? First, why. Why is the gift given? The, the aim of this gift is that the members of the church should be fully equipped. God has given these gifts we're going to see so that the church will be fully equipped. The word in Greek for equipped, and Greek is the language that this book was written in, the book of Ephesians, this letter was written, is katakartism. And it's a word, in the, in the way Paul uses it, the medical term for this word, is that of a bone that's been broken, that's been reset so that it can strengthen and be used the way it's supposed to. In Mark chapter 1, the same word is used of fishing nets that have holes in them that have been knitted together and re-strengthened and repurposed so that they can be used the way God designed them to be used. In Galatians chapter 6, the same Greek word is used of the body of Christ when there are schisms or divisions that this word is used to pull the church back together, that it be knitted together so the church can function the way God meant for it to. The basic idea of the word is that of putting a thing into condition in which it ought to be so it can work effectively. God gave us these gifts so the church can be fully equipped. The next thing we see, the next reason of the why, 
is that, is that the church would work together so that service may go on. So that service may go on, not church service, but service to one another. The word here in Greek is diakonos, for service. And it's the idea of practical service to one another. It's the idea of serving one another. Now there's four places in the New Testament where Paul gives us a list of the gifts he's given the church, that God has given the church. And those gifts come in the form of us. He's placed those gifts in each one of us. Every one of us has a God-given gift for the purpose of serving the church. And this word diakonos can be summed up in a question. How can I help? Where can I serve? The question that's never asked is, what's in it for me? What do I get out of it? It's the idea of serving one another. I've put the scriptures that contain the other gifts on your outline. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4. On the back side of your outline where the questions are for your small group or in your personal study, there are some questions, and I just want to challenge you. Read through these lists. And these lists are not all-encompassing. There are other gifts as well that God's given. But what do you have, and how do we use it to serve the church? We'll talk about that in a little bit uh, more. Also, in your bulletin, there's a, I call it yellow. I'm a guy. I only know like four colors. So there's a yellowish, off-white insert with some roles that we could use some help with in the church. Maybe you could fit in one of those roles. I'd encourage you to take the time. Please prayerfully read over that and see if there's a fit. So the next why is to see that the body of Christ is built up. The body of Christ is built up. The work of ministry and in the church is to be constructive, not destructive. Constructive, not destructive. Destructive. Even if there's correction that needs to happen, even if there's a confrontation between two people that needs to take place, the goal of the confrontation, the goal is always construction or the building up of the body of Christ and not destruction. It's always to strengthen and never to loosen the fabric of the church. It's the building up of the body of Christ and not any one person. No church leader should ever have on their agenda their brand, their clientele, their spread of their influence. The role is always the promotion of Christ's bride and God himself. It's the building up of the church. John the Baptist said it this way, Jesus must increase and I must decrease. Jesus must be the one who's exalted. The next aim, the next why, is that members of the church should arrive at perfect unity perfect unity. That means there's no schisms, there's no divisions, there's no party, uh, party thing going on as far as divisions between people. Uh, there's no, this is my opinion, this is what I want. Paul calls the church to perfect unity. Unity is hard enough. Perfect unity is setting the bar really high. And the larger things get, the harder unity becomes. How many of you had more than one child? Can I see a show of hands? Okay. How many of you were a part of a family that had more than one child? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, a number of you were. Uh, if you've ever been on a job with more than one person, with people comes a multiplication of challenge. So we had four kids. First one came along and, you know, first child, oh, we're so overwhelmed. This is so hard. Please, that was a warm-up. One child, it's like, where's the child? You find the child. One child. You have one bedtime, you have one feeding time, you have one diaper changing time, you have one personality to deal with. Then the second child came along, and that challenge factor doubled. Now there's two feeding times, and two bedtimes, and two personalities, and one wants to watch Barney, and one wants to watch Caillou. I mean, now everything has just doubled as far as complexity. The third child comes around. We've just now tripled the complexity. Three bedtimes, three feeding times, three opinions on favorite food and favorite music, three personalities to try and, and work through the minefield of. But we could deal with three. Because you go to the store, mom watches one, dad watches one, and one goes in the cart. We can do that. Then the fourth comes along. 
you've just now quadrupled the complexity of your household. One watch is watched by mom, one is watched by dad, one is in the cart, and one is hiding in the clothes rack. <laughs> With more people comes more complexity of unity. And I'll tell you this, as a church, we have to work harder for the unity of our church as the church grows as more opinions come into play, as more taste and more personalities come into play, as, as we broaden the way we do certain things. We have to work harder toward unity. We must work harder at preferring one another. The next one, the aim is that the members of the church should be more like Christ. And this is our ongoing call. This is our ongoing purpose, is that each one of us be as much of a man or a woman of God, be continually growing in how much we look like Christ and how we're walking closer with him. That's part of the reason for the gifts that God gives the church. Not for the purpose of the gift that's given to the person, but for how this gift can help others become more like Christ. There's one more that I didn't put on your outline, but I want to make sure I cover it this morning, and that's this. One of the goals... One of the whys, one of the aims of the church, of these gifts, is the protection of the church. The protection of Christ's bride. Verse 14 says, Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful schemes. In every part of history there has been a group of people trying to infiltrate the church for their own personal gain and or for the demise of the church they are there for what they can get out of it for the game that they can play for what they can do for themselves paul words it as cunning and craftiness of the people another translation calls it clever trickery of men and the word here in greek is kubia for clever trickery and it literally translates skilled in manipulating the dice skilled in manipulating the dice i know how to play the game i know how to work my way into the system i know how to make this thing work for me they're skilled at manipulating the dice and as a church and especially as church leadership as elder church leaders and also as staff we take our responsibility very seriously of protecting the bride of christ matthew chapter 7 and verse 5 says it this way beware of wolves in sheep's clothing 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, Be aware of those who make their way into the church to deceive, lie, steal, abuse, and take advantage of. We take this call seriously. And some people look at the pieces we're putting into place and you say, Oh, it's red tape. It's more hoops to jump through. I hate red tape. I hate hoops, but I love the church. I love the bride of Christ. I love the children that run around in this church. And we have a responsibility with them to protect the body of Christ. One thing I think I have failed at, and I take this responsibility, I have failed at is clarifying the why of some of the pieces we put in place, some of the things that we put in place. For example, ministry training pieces. We will continually have ministry training, continually upping the bar of what we do in our classes, our ministries, our outreach. We continually want to have ministry training so that we are better equipped to care for the bride of Christ. We're better equipped at what we do, not for ourselves, but that we may serve, that we may serve better. The second thing that we do is we have what we call a general leadership application. If you serve in or you'd like to serve in ministry at Spring Lake, it's a basic application that, that we ask you to fill out, everybody to fill out who serves, so that we know that you understand the role. We have job description or ministry descriptions for these roles, so it's clear for you. But you understand what we're asking you to do. You understand if it's a good fit for you. And then especially if you're a teacher, we want to make sure we're on the same page biblically. God has given us his word, and we take it seriously. We understand that there's a responsibility with how it's taught. We ask people to fill that form out. And the last thing that we're doing, and this is something that's, that's newer, but we're doing background checks on everyone 
who serves in ministry. Everyone who serves in ministry. As I said earlier, there are people who come into the church with their own purposes, and you hear me say this, and you're like, why in the church do I have to go through this? Because I don't know about you, but I get tired of seeing churches show up on the front page of the newspaper for all the wrong reasons. Scandal. Ponzi scheme. Someone comes in the church and says, I can help the church raise a lot of money. Trust me. They seem like a good guy. That sounds really good. And then they're in South America with a drink with an umbrella in it, and the church is going, where'd the money go? I'm tired of reading about schemes. I'm tired of reading about abuses within the church. And I love the bride of Christ. So we're putting this piece in place, and we're asking if you're newer to ministry, we'll ask. If you're involved in ministry, we'll ask that you fill this out. If you say, I don't know if I want to go that far, we would just ask that you take a step back then from serving because we are taking this this seriously. We want to protect the church, the bride of Christ. I would rather inconvenience people or maybe even be a problem or a, a, a bug for people than hurt the church, the local body, the testimony that the church has within our community and especially protecting our children. If you have any questions on that, please feel free to come up and ask me afterwards. I'll be glad to have that conversation. To sum it up, up on the screen is kind of a summary statement as to the why God gave these gifts. The aim of the church is that her members should, be, should reach a stature which can be measured by the fullness of Christ. In other words, every one of us is moving more towards the fullness of Christ, becoming more like Christ. The aim of the church is nothing less than to produce men and women who have in them the reflection of Jesus Christ himself. Are we becoming more like Jesus? That's the goal of the gifts God gives the church. Let's talk about the gifts now. The first gift that's listed is the role of the apostle. The apostle. Now, this term is an interesting one. It translates, it literally means one sent on a mission. Sent one. one. A person sent on a mission to a people group, to a cause, to a purpose. One sent on a mission. And when you start in the Bible with the apostles, it always starts with the 12. The 12 who walked with Jesus. I call them the capital A apostles. These are the ones who saw the miracles, who were there in Jesus' teaching. They saw the death, the burial, and they also witnessed the resurrection. Those 12 are Peter, Andrew, James the older, James the younger, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, Jude, Simon, and Judas. Capital A Apostles. Now with time, this group was bound to die off. It just happens. We get older, they pass on. Does that mean that's the only apostles the Bible lists? No, the Bible lists more apostles later on. Barnabas was an apostle. Acts 14 and verse 4. He wasn't one of the original 12, but he's still called an apostle. Two different places in Acts 14. James, the brother of Jesus, was an apostle. 1 Corinthians 15 and Galatians 1. Not one of the 12, but still an apostle. Silvanus was an apostle. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6. Andronicus and Junius were apostles. Romans 16 and verse 7. There were still apostles, lowercase a. They weren't one of the 12. They weren't the ones who walked with Jesus, but they were still called and sent on a specific mission. They were sent in an area where no one had been with a machete saying, clear the way for the church to come through. There are still people today with this gift and with this calling, but we may not call them apostle. You don't see too many people with the word apostle on their business card. They may go by the term missionary, going into an unreached people group, a part of the world where no one else has gone. They may be called superintendent, where they oversee a group of pastors, and they're helping to start new churches in new areas, and they're making sure doctrine stays true to Scripture. One person said, people with the apostolic gift see over the horizon. They're able to look at the spiritual landscape and see where God is working. Another person said that there's kind of this entrepreneurial heart in an, in an apostolic person that, that sees not only where we are, but where do we need to go? What needs to happen? Where, the, where, the, where does the church need to head directionally? The second gift mentioned is the prophet. The prophet. Now, the prophet didn't do so much foretelling as forthtelling. 
they didn't so much speak to one person's life as speak to the direction of the move of God. A prophet is not a fortune teller. Let me see your palm. I see lots of money in your future. I see a job change in your future. I see someone tall, dark, and handsome. I see someone beautiful. That's not the prophet's call. The prophet's call was the direction of God's call on the church and on his people. Not foretelling, not fortune telling, but forth telling the direction the church needs to go. Sometimes it is specifically directional. Sometimes it's in correction or rebuke. It's not always an easy thing to say, but God gives that prophetic voice to people. There are people in this church who I know when they pray, God speaks to them in this way. They've shown it over time. The voice of the prophetic is also a scary gift to have or a scary voice because if you go through history, it's always the people who speak up prophetically who end up being martyred or tortured or in prison because they call things out the way they see it as God is seeing it. They call wrong, wrong. They call unrighteousness, unrighteousness. They call guilty people, guilty people. And how many of you know that doesn't always go over real well? The prophetic usually goes through some rough stuff. And I want to say there's a dark side to the prophetic we've got to be careful of. And that's people who come in and use it for their personal gain. When a thousand people send me a hundred thousand dollars, then you'll see in your mailbox tomorrow something good. God told me, send me the money. It's not about the person or the gift. It's about the church and the king that God has called us to use and serve with our gift with. It will promote the name of Christ and not themselves. I want to challenge you. Anyone who comes to you and says, God told me for your life, first of all, it has to line up with Scripture. It must line up with the Word of God. That's our measuring stick always, always. Secondly, do not give anyone free space in your mind. Do not let someone direct the course of your life. God will, um, will um, show it to be true through the witness of other people and also in your own life. You'll see it happen. Don't just throw your life to the wind based on what one person may say. Use wisdom in it. But God has brought this gift to the church. I was in, a friend who was in a service one time, someone got up, I got a word from the Lord for the church and and God is gonna keep the church and God is with it and, and don't worry about anything and just as Moses put the animals in the ark, I will be with you and protect you. And then the person said, Oh, I've made a mistake, saith the Lord. It was Noah who put the animal in. The... That should be a flag. A friend of mine was in a worship service where someone said, I've got a word from the Lord. And they began to speak, and this is the direction, and this is what the Lord would say, and here's how they ended it. And thus saith the Lord, There's too many guitars on the worship team. We need more piano personal preference in the name of God. That is not the call of the prophet. That's not how the gift of the prophet or the prophetic works. Gina and I were in a, in a role where we had stepped away from a specific ministry, and I thought I was done. To be honest, I didn't know if I was going back in the ministry. I was fried, burnt, and a woman came up to me. She had a little pers- people, purple piece of paper I keep it in my wallet at all times. And she drew a little circle and a little bridge and a big circle. And she had had a stroke, so she wasn't really clear with her words. And she said, God told me to share this with you. The little circle, this is where you've been. And it it was a smaller church. They did not want to grow. They were comfortable with where things were. Then there was this bridge, and she said, this bridge is going to be tough, but it's going to be short, but it's going to be tough. She said, and this other circle is what God has waiting on the other side. And yes, we had to cross that bridge, and it was not easy, but we could not even have imagined what God had in store waiting on the other side of it. God still speaks. God has not been muted. He still speaks, and there's still a prophetic voice. It's in the Old Testament, it's in the New Testament, and the Bible tells us it's going to be all the way until the day Jesus comes back. 
Acts chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. It says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream, dream. your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Fourth tell, speak the direction and the calling of God for his people. The next gift is the evangelist. The evangelist. Paul writes to Timothy and he says, do the work of an evangelist in 2 Timothy 4, 5. These are the bringers of the good news. These are the ones who take the message out of the church and bring it into the world around. All of us have this responsibility, but some people have this gift or this call, this ability to do it at a high level, at a very effective rate. They are, one person said, they are the rank and file missionaries. They roll their sleeves up. It's not a glorious task. They get their hands dirty, but they bring the message outside of the building. Here's what an evangelist is not. An evangelist is not someone who pulls up to the church in their van with a trailer behind it with a big dove painted on the side and speaks to Christ followers about what it means to follow Christ. That's not the gift of an evangelist. An evangelist takes the message out of the church and brings it to people who may not know. Takes the message of the good news of Jesus. The gospel, the evangelion, that's where we get the word uh, evangelist. The good news and takes it out to those who do not know it. As one person said, and I love this term, they are the cultural artist who can take the message of Christ and bring it to life in a culture and a group that may not understand or may never have heard. The gift of the evangelist. The next is the gift of the pastor. And the pastor of all these terms, pastor is only used one time in the New Testament. And we think of how many pastors we know or see, and yet it's the one name that's actually used the least. It's used one time. But the idea of pastor, the Greek word that's used for pastor, is the same idea as a shepherd. It's the one who cares for the sheep. You have to remember when the book of Ephesians was written, this, the city of Ephesus, the church is this little island speck of, of faith in God and in Christ in a sea of paganism. And those who came into the church knew very little to nothing. They just knew there was something about Jesus. The pastor, the shepherd, had the responsibility of caring for those who came in bringing them into the body of Christ. As we talked about over this whole series, that it wasn't just they coming in. They were now we. They were part of us. Jew, Gentile, Scythian, barbarian, anybody who came in the church, who called upon the name of the Lord, who who believed in Christ, became part of us, the body of Christ. The pastor had the responsibility of caring for the sheep, caring for the church. Now, sometimes pastor and teacher go hand in hand. Sometimes they don't. There are some people who just have that heart to care for people. My dad, as a pastor, was the consummate pastor. He spent his time, he never had monstrous church by church growth standards, but he cared for and loved people. He poured his life into counseling people, walking beside people through tough seasons of their life. He poured his life into into training and discipling and mentoring new believers. I kid you not, if you were going in the hospital and you were part of his church, he was at the hospital an hour before you were supposed to arrive. He would talk to the doctors. He would talk to the nurses. What's going to happen? What are the side effects? What should we be aware of? So by the time you showed up for your surgery, he had all the homework done. He would tell you what to expect. He was there through the whole process. And when the anesthesia wore off and your eyes began to open, my dad would be sitting right beside you in the hospital bed. Do you need something to drink? Do you need something to eat? Can I get you anything? You want a magazine? And he would tell you, you know, they said the medicine, you're going to have a little dry mouth. You may feel a little delusional at first. He would call the family. Hey, look, they're coming through. They're doing great. You've got nothing to worry about. Here's some of the side effects. He had a passionate heart to care for the sheep. It's a gift. It's a gift to the body of Christ. It's not about the person who has the gift. It's how can I serve with the gift I've been given. The the pastor is a tough role, but it is a gift. It is a calling to the local church. Barclay's commentary said it this way. 
The picture of the shepherd is indelibly written on in the New Testament. They were the person who cared for the flock and led the sheep into safe places. They were the person who sought the sheep when they wandered away and if needed, even died to save the sheep. The shepherd of the flock of God is the person who bears God's people on their heart, who feeds them with truth, who seeks them when they stray away, and who defends them from all that would hurt their faith. The duty is laid on every Christian that we should be brothers and sisters in Christ, but the gift of the pastor is given to the church for the care of the body of Christ. The next gift that we see is the teacher. The teacher. Now, you and I this morning, we can come to church and we can open a Bible, whether we brought it with us or whether it's in the seat back or whether it's on our mobile devices. We've got Bibles every, we've got Bibles coming out our noses. We've got notes that we can write everything down. We can jot down what we want to hold on to. You got to remember, in this day and age when Ephesians was written, they didn't have Bibles. They didn't have paper and pen. Everything that was taught had to be taught in such a way that it could be grasped and comprehended and held onto in their mind. And once again, these are people who were coming in at zero. No Sunday school training, no, no history in the Bible, no understanding of what church was. And the teacher had to take these people from nothing and train them in the ways of God and in the teachings of the scriptures. As I said, sometimes people have the gift of teaching and pastoring, sometimes they don't. Sometimes people are just gifted with specifically with the gift to teach, to bring God's truth to life. It's a calling, it's a gifting to be able to teach God's word and do it well and do it accurately. Here's what I love about God's plan for the church. These five gifts, and once again, I'd encourage you, read the other three uh, accounts of gifts in the church. Here's what I love about God's gifts to the church. They bring balance to the body of Christ. The apostle goes in, machete in hand, clears a path, goes into a place where no one may have ever been before. Maybe they reach a people group in a community that's never been reached before. The prof prophetic voice comes along, make sure the church stays on task and stays on point and, and hears the voice of God for direction. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the evangelist makes sure that the church doesn't get comfortable just being sheep in the sheep pen. Because let's be real, we all love the pastor who feeds us well, who brushes out our, our wool, who scratches us behind the ear, who allows us to stay with our friends in the sheep pen. But that's not what God called the church to be. He's given us the evangelist to shake us up and he's called us all to, act, to put into practice evangelism to get us out of the building and take the message into the community with a testimony of the church being an example of what the Lord has called us to be. The evangelist goes out, brings the message of God out into the community. People come back into the church. The shepherds care for the flock. Make sure the flock comes together as one. Walks along people who are going through tough things. Mentors, uh, disciples, trains. And then the teacher comes along and makes sure we stay founded and grounded on the word of God. God's church, God's plan, his gifts to the body are to bring health and balance to the body of Christ. That his bride would be ready for his return. I'm going to give you a couple of closing challenges with this. First of all is this. Don't make church a place you go to. Make church something you're a part of. The gifts and abilities you have, God's given gifts to the church and they're buried, they're a part of each one of us. And the church is effective when we are serving together. So don't make it something you go to. Make it something you're a part of. Secondly, know what your gifts are. Know what your gifts are. And, and you may be saying, I've been in the church. I've been trying to figure this out for years. Ask the people around you. Talk to the people in your small group, those who know you well. Read through these lists in the scriptures. Where does your puzzle piece fit? Because the body of Christ needs it. Find out. We have something coming up on December 10th and 11th, that weekend. It's called Launch. 
It'll be after the service on Saturday night. It will be after this service on that Sunday morning. And all of our ministries, uh, many of our ministry leaders will be available for you to ask the question, do I fit in this ministry? Do, do my gifts fit here? We want to see people plug in and serve in a way that glorifies and honors God and brings joy to what we do. He's gifted us for this. And please, please, please read the last half of chapter 4 sometime this week. Read the last half of chapter 4 to get ready for chapter 5. God has called us to be the body of Christ, to strengthen and encourage each other, to be a testimony, a light for the community around us, and to bring the message into the community in which he's placed us. Would you bow your head?